on constraint modeling. Uh, we will uh, start uh, with uh, two papers uh, presented uh, by the same speaker, Sebastian Link, uh, and uh, we will have, uh, have a paper by Stefan Hartmann. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that uh, all questions uh, uh, and um, will be taken on Zoom. So please use uh, only the Zoom platform uh, and the chat in Zoom uh, to, to ask uh, questions uh, uh, to, be, to be able to see them. Okay, so uh, we will start uh, uh, with uh, the first paper by Sebastian Link. Sebastian is a professor of computer science at the University of Auckland, where he directs the data science program. Uh, which are famous for the development of the language R. Sebastian's research interests are uh, uh, in data modeling, data quality, database design, and database theory, and he publishes and reviews regularly in conferences such as uh, SIGMOD, ICDE, LDB, and journals, uh, uh, Stots Information Systems, and uh, the LDB journal. So he, his uh, first paper uh, he presents uh, is about referential integrity under uncertain data. Uh, so, Sebastian, please, uh, you can uh, start your presentation. Yeah. Uh, can everybody see? Yes. Okay. I, I, okay, I've got four notes. I take that, that's all. Um, okay, uh, thank you for the nice introduction, Barbara. Um, yeah, hello and welcome also, also for me. Uh, for me, it's now uh, 21 hours, so 9 p.m. Uh, in, in the evening. Just brought my kids to bed and hope they are asleep. Um, so, so I'll be talking about referential integrity um, under uncertainty. So I wanted to draw a little picture and uncertainty. You have, you have the dice in here and referential integrity. Well, you have one example in here as well. It looks a bit fuzzy, the picture. That's of course intentional um, because it's uh, uncertain. So um, I thought this was a good picture. Um, so then, um, of course, um, you know, referential integrity is one of the pillar stones in, in relational databases. Um, refers to one of many integrity principles, perhaps the three uh, most popular ones are domain integrity, entity integrity, and, and referential integrity. Of course, um, there are also many more. And um, basically, uh, referential integrity makes sure that the data is appropriately referenced um, across uh, multiple tables. And this on one side ensures also the minimization of data redundancy across the tables and therefore, um, you know, good update properties. It's, it's also the foundation of, of well-designed databases. So particularly the logical grouping of data into entities, relationships, higher order relationships. Um, and yeah, we can efficiently update um, when we have these relationships and also effectively specify queries and, and many of them also efficiently execute them. Um, it's of course also the basis then, um, you know, for for more advanced uh, database design like data warehouses and so on. But certainly in, in relational databases, there there is no uncertainty. There's no place for uncertainty there. That's largely historical, based on the motivations, uh, based on the applications that that um, you know were prevalent back then. Um, of course, uh, since you know uh, then uh, a lot of ha has happened. And there's sort of a big call for uh, handling also uncertain data. And it's of course, sort of one manifestation of it is the veracity of, of big data. There's a, sort of a famous or infamous uh, study from IBM um, who interviewed quite a few uh, business leader in, in, in the subject matter. And one of one in three of them basically said that they actually don't trust the information that they use to make their decisions. Um, the veracity is also regarded as the dark side of, of big data and, you know, the poor data quality actually costs, costs them a lot, whether it's exactly this number, of course, nobody really knows. Um, data integration itself also poses a lot of challenges, right? So ev even if the uh, business rules are, you know, magically valid uh, within your silos of information after you integrate them, it might be a whole different game. Um, so. Uh, that also causes some some issues with with uncertainty as well, and um, one can deal with uncertainty in in many different ways. Usually, one should look at you know what what's the most appropriate one. Um, with a probabilistic approach, of course, there there are other issues. You have to maintain um, you know nice probability distributions, which um, is not is not very easy to do in the first place. 
Um, but among others, you can also not specify to, to which data actually the, the, the business rules apply. Um, yeah, so this, is, so this is one of the issues. And what we want to achieve uh, on, a, on a bigger scheme is we want to address the poor big data quality by kind of making uncertainty of data first class citizen also in, in relational databases. So that's kind of the intention of the, of the bigger scheme in here. And in this particular paper, we, we basically look at referential integrity um, for, for uncertain data. So what we're gonna look at is we, we look at the model of, of uncertainty data. This is sort of an extension from uh, one table to many tables of an approach that we've introduced before. Um, then we will introduce inclusion dependencies um, under this model. And um, we'll also talk a little bit about how to reason about inclusion dependencies um, under this model again as well. Um, so let's have a look um, at, at, at one example where let's say we have a very simple legacy database with a very um, you know, classical example where, where we have parts, we have suppliers, and then we have a catalog which lists um, the parts uh, supplied by suppliers at a particular price. And now we have three different legacy databases and um, you know, th there should be some referential integrity here from the catalog, the part number, of course, should be referencing the part number in part, and the SID should be referencing the SID in the supplier table. Of course, if we go into practice, that um, actually hardly ever happens nicely. Um, here it does to some degree in some of the databases, but now suppose we, we want to merge this, and this is a very simplistic scenario. So we have only the same tables, we only have the same attributes over the same tables. Of course, in practice, this, this is also too simplistic, but it serves as a good enough example in here to, to understand um, sort of where, where we're coming from. So, so assume we, we have this and now we want to integrate. So how we integrate this in here, we just build a union over, over each of the tables from, from the legacy data. And then we, we get something like this. Um, but no information is actually preserved that indicates how likely the tuples occur in the legacy databases. So, so we kind of lose any information about um, the uncertainty in here. And um, now the question is, okay, so, so what, what could we do um, to preserve at least some of the information in there? And one thing to do is that we, we could assign, let's say, different levels of, of trust. Um, or possibility, different degrees of possibility to uh, these tuples. And we could simply say if um, a tuple occurs in all three legacy databases in, in the same table, then um, we, we assign the degree of, of universal to it. So, so you can see this tuple in here, this tuple up in here, this tuple in here, they occurred in all three legacy databases. So that's why it got assigned this, this degree of universal. If it appears in two legacy databases, we say it's common. If it only appears in one legacy database, it's, it's isolated. So it doesn't matter how I name these, it just matters that, that they are different. And of course, in a sense, universal associates more certainty or, or a higher degree of possibility of this tuple than um, the common degree. And the common degree is, is um, you know, more possible than, than the isolated degree, if you want. For those tuples that do not occur, uh, we could also assign a degree let's say, um, impossible. So that's, that's kind of the motivation and this is kind of the uncertainty that we're talking about. And now we can, we can formalize this a little bit more. So what we in fact do is we assign some degree, some degree of possibility with each of the tuples. And these are not probabilities, these are degrees of possibility. Um, so, so here the degrees of possibility are, are, are discrete. So there's only a finite number of these degrees. They can, can be customized to whatever the information needs are in our system um, and can then be dealt with also efficiently as we, as we will see later on. So basically the records get assigned some degree of possibility. We've just seen one example to do this. There are many others and that's sort of um, a, a different line of work. Um, I've just showed you one, but we, we simply assume here we have some kind of function that assigns to these tuples a degree of, of possibility, whether that's a trust or something else, or you know, um, an association or aggregation of multiple factors, um, we leave that to the application. So we, we just assume there is such a finite linear chain. So, so this is strictly ordered in here. 
Alpha 1 is the highest possibility degree, followed by Alpha 2, up to Alpha K, and then Alpha K plus 1 is actually the bottom degree, which is reserved for those tuples which do not occur actually in, in our table in here. So in each instance, with each instance, we assign with each tuple essentially one of these possibility degrees in here. And then we, we have this. And in our example, Alpha 1 was, uh, was uh, universal, Alpha 2 was essentially uh, common, and Alpha 3 was, um, what did we use, isolated. Right, so, and, and then we can associate sort of a possible world semantics with this, where the world WI basically contains all the records that are of possibility degree alpha i or higher. So the smallest world actually contains only all those records that have possibility degree alpha one. So it only contains those tuples that are marked in red in here. So that's a classical, um, you know, relational database instance, if you want. So just the tuples in red in here, that's, that's our first world, that's our smallest world in here. And then world W2 would contain all the records with P degree alpha one or alpha two. So also include the next one. And that would be all these tuples. So they have either degree alpha one or alpha two. And um, if we want to include world W3, then uh, we have all the tuples that have any P degree from alpha one, alpha two and alpha three. So those would be then, you know, all the tuples that, that are listed in here explicitly. Right, so this is how we can build our, our possible worlds um, based on these uh, P degrees. And um, we can then also talk about integrity constraints. And the, the integrity constraints, they're actually now assigned a degree of certainty depending in which worlds they essentially hold. If they hold in all the worlds, they are fully certain. So they hold for all the tuples that are involved. Um, if they only hold, you know, in the, in the second, largest world, then, you know, then we can say, okay, so they uh, hold with a second degree of certainty and, and so on. So let's look at a few examples. So again, for these certainty degrees in here, we, we have again a discrete um, linear chain in here. And uh, again, beta one is, is the highest degree of certainty up to beta K and then beta K plus one means it's not certain at all. So it, it, it does not even need to hold in the smallest possible world if you want. So if we look at, let's say a key over, let's say catalog, right? So we see, okay, so with which degree of certainty is P number here a key? Well, it's definitely, it definitely holds with degree beta three because in the smallest possible world with P degree alpha one, there's only one tuple, only this tuple in here. So certainly this one holds, but then if we, if we go in the second possible world, so we would need to include these tuples and here we have already some duplication. So the key does not hold with a certainty degree higher than beta three. So it does hold with beta three only in here. Um, so similar for, for SID in here, um, certainly holds in the smallest possible world, which has only degree alpha one. Um, and again, if we go to world, if, if we go to the second um, smallest world, we have already some degree of duplication in here. So it only holds with beta three. So if you look at the, the composite key of, um, you know, P number and SID, <clears throat> then this holds here um, at least with beta three, uh, even holds with, with beta two because there's no duplication in here. And it even holds with beta one because again, there are no duplicates. So this one holds with full certainty. And then we can look, of course, also at foreign keys, what we're interested in here uh, in, in, in this talk. And if we look on, on catalog again, the, the P number um, should reference a unique part number over part. All right, so again, we can look at the smallest possible word where P1 uniquely references P1 in here. So that's, that's fine, holds at least with beta three. And then for P2, well, it's not satisfied. P2 does not occur in this world. So it in fact only holds with, with beta three, does not hold even with beta two. Um, for SID and supplier, so the supplier ID from catalog should uniquely reference um, a supplier from this table. And the SID in here does reference the SID in here in the, in the smallest possible world. So holds with beta three. 
if we go up to the next one, that's still fine, S1, S2, and S1, still reference um, S1 and S2 in here. Um, but if we go higher, S3 um, is, is not referenced in here anymore. Um, so that's a missing, missing reference. So it does not hold with beta one, only holds with beta two. Right, so if we look at a standard um, ER diagram in here, so how, how could we get this information in? Well, you know, we could, we could assign degrees of certainties to, to the keys. So we can just put down, since we only have one key on each table and, and, and uh, we, we could simply assign these degrees to all the attributes that have the key. So those are underlined in here. So we assign one to P number in here and the same here. So holds with full certainty over supply and over part the keys. Um, if we look at this table from before, we could also assign um, this key here to, to the composite key um, of part and supplier. And for the um, for those edges that um, basically in, indicate uh, foreign keys, we can write the certainty degrees as well. So here catalog is referencing supplier with certainty two and here uh, the parts with certainty three. So this is just, uh, just the certainty degrees that we had from before. So this is how we could augment um, an ER diagram to uh, make sure we have uncertainty in there as well. So then what's, what's the formal definition of, of such a possibilistic inclusion dependency? Well, it's a, it's a formal, formula like, like this and um, the degree beta i here um, is, is one of these certainty degrees and then we can define what the marginal certainty degree is of, of a normal inclusion dependency on a possibilistic database and that's the certainty degree beta k plus two minus i uh, for those smallest, smallest possible world dbi in which this constraint is actually violated in here. So and if it's the case that even the largest possible world um, satisfies the inclusion dependency, then it's actually um, with full certainty. So, so then we assign degree beta one. So then we say that um, such a possibilistic database satisfies a possibilistic inclusion dependency with degree beta i if the marginal possibility degree of the inclusion dependency is at least of degree beta i in here. So that, that would be the formal definition. There are other choices, but we found this one to be um, sort of the most, uh, probably the simplest one and, and also sort of the perhaps the most intuitive one. So if you want to reason about these, uh, we have the standard implication problem and basically ask whether a given inclusion dependency in here is implied by a given set of inclusion dependencies um, in the logical sense. So uh, if this is our input and this is our set of uh, possibilistic inclusion dependencies um, and the C degrees come, come from this range, then we answer yes, if it's implied and no otherwise. And um, so, sort of we have an axiomatic solution for this. So, so these are basically, this is the axiomatization from the relational model for inclusion dependencies from 1982 from Casanova Fagin, or he's a typo. So there shouldn't be an A in here. And Papadimitrio from 1982. So they have the reflexivity rule, the permutation and projection rule, and um, essentially the transitivity rule. And now we can augment this um, and just put degrees of certainty in here. And then we have two additional rules, kind of have a bottom rule that every inclusion dependency holds with bottom degree and, and that we can always weaken the certainty degree in here. And then this can be shown to be um, sound and complete. Um, as an algorithmic solution, um, um, in the interest of time, I think I, I, I skipped that, but what you can essentially do is you can take the possibilistic constraints and you can cut them. So, so if you have, if you are given um, a certainty degree beta, then you simply take those standard inclusion dependencies um, from, from those ones that are given in, in the possibilistic set where the certainty degree is at least as high as the given beta. And then you get your standard inclusion dependencies in here. And then you can reduce the implication problem of possibilistic inclusion dependencies to the beta cut in here and the standard inclusion dependency, um, which is the candidate for, for implication essentially. So and then it turns out that again, the, the implication problem, the, all the computational complexity results essentially carry over um, to possibilistic inclusion dependencies. So in particular can be decided in deterministic quadratic space. 
um, the application problem is, is still p-space complete, but uh, fixed parameter tractable in, in the arity actually. So all the results carry over and, and similarly um, with, uh, with the algorithm um, to decide implications. So this can be done uh, relatively simple, simply. So if we have, for example, these inclusion dependencies given, so here uh, on top of the other ones that were given, we have another sales table that references the catalog table and it has a sales ID together with some kind of uh, total uh, of, of the sales. And then this one is, is our candidate. What we can do is we can first use the cut on beta two, which leaves us just with sigma one and sigma three because sigma two has only degree beta three in here. So we, we cut this off. Then here um, in this step, uh, we, we can't simply terminate, but then we start with the left-hand side of the candidate inclusion dependency, which is sales SID, and then we keep on going. So we then check for which inclusion dependencies in the cut um, do we actually have the left-hand side in the set E, and this is here sales SID, and there is such an inclusion dependency to, to catalog, which is why we also include catalog in our set in here. And then um, this continues until we cannot reach further changes. And then we can use the first inclusion dependency because we have catalog SID in, in the set E and we have this inclusion dependency. We can also include the right-hand side, which is in the supplier SID. And uh, yeah, so that's it. So, so then we can already stop because we, we chased our target, which is supplier SID in here. And then we can simply return yes, and this in fact holds. Um, but if we replace this by beta one in here, the cut would basically end up with sigma three, which would then not be implied anymore. So, so this is only implied with, with beta two, but not with beta one. And um, this is basically what, what we can show here as well. Um, so how can we use this? Well, we can use it, for example, um, of course, to, to optimize updates. Um, so for instance, uh, we, could, we could show um, by application of the inference rules that this one is, is implied by this one. So if this is implied, then of course, updates become simpler. We don't have to enforce, we don't have to validate that this rule holds after we've validated that all these rules are hold in here. So updates become um, more efficient because we don't have to redundantly check uh, integrity. Similarly, we can optimize queries. So whether that's sort of logical tuning or physical tuning, um, we could, for instance, create indices and foreign key columns that are tailored to the possibility degrees to which the possibilistic inclusion dependencies apply. Um, so an example for logical rewriting would be this, where here we can essentially delete um, one of the where clauses uh, in here because it's implied already by, by this one up in here, so we don't need this. But um, this is not always the case because this inclusion dependency only holds with degree beta two, so that doesn't apply to alpha three, so that's why we cannot optimize this query down in here. Um, similarly, if okay. we wanted to do- You should uh, go towards the conclusion now. All right. Thank you. So, Essentially, uh, possibility theory here is, can be an effective approach to entity and referential integrity of, of uncertain data. Uh, so in particular, the referential integrity in the possibilistic sense would mean that the children records should have no higher P degree than the parent record that they reference, otherwise something is, is, is wrong. Um, and uh, if you follow our approach, then the computational properties carry over from the relational databases at no um, additional cost. And uh, it helps us in, in managing uncertain data. Um, as in the classical case, we can enforce integrity during updates, we can do query optimization, but there are also different ways of doing sort of uh, data cleansing as, as well. And um, for future work, well, I'd actually like to extend the relational model um, more to this approach by combining, for example, entity integrity with referential integrity look at the um, famous inclusion dependency normal form, which is often the result of, you know, conceptual data modeling, like higher order ER modeling. So there's a lot of uncertainty ahead in here, if you like. And I think I'll, I'll stop here and invite some questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. 
I see that uh, there is uh, a question uh, in the chat. Can you see that? I will uh, read it. Uh, you use a yeah, global approach it. to safety. Uh, should the alpha be normalized first? Um, and then there is a second and a third question. If you mm -hmm. yeah. want to take that. So, 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 so yeah, so that that's right. So in, in this approach, we, we kind of already normalized it. In practice, I, I suppose this, this could be done differently, um, but uh, the, the inventors of, of possibility theory, they have all sorts of um, approaches how to, how to deal with this. Um, so that's basically, I, I just refer here to sort of work that's already been done by, by the inventors in, in possibility theory. Um, I think they've recently written a, sort of a, a, a nice paper about um, how to do these things. But, but yeah, in, in this approach, um, we, we assume that there's some kind of normalization for the possibility degrees in here. Probably organizations also want to do this in practice, otherwise it gets simply too confusing for, for, for using this. Um, axiomatization of referential constraints with keys. Um, yeah, axiomatization, yeah, that would be interesting. I mean, so, so it's already known that um, even, even I think the, the implication problem for just keys and foreign keys together is already undecidable. Um, but yeah, an axiomatization would be nice. Yes. Um, so that's, I, well, at least in the, in, in, in the classical sense, I think, um, yeah, so th th that's still at least open, I think, perhaps already in the relational model, um, unless you have a better idea. Um, can I extend this to plausible logics? Um, don't know. Interesting question. <laughs> Thank you. There, I see another uh, uh, question in the question and answer session, if you see it, from Giacomo Bergami. Otherwise, I, re I read it. Yeah. What is the advantage of using possibilities of a customary probabilities frequencies approach? And so on. You see it. Yeah. So, so there are... Um... So there are two types of, 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 of differences, right? So, so one, and, and, and you basically, you're referring to the second one, um, which is, has to deal with, um, you know, computational efficiency. And, and, and typically, if, if you use the possibility approach in the right way, then, then yes, uh, typically the, the computational complexity carries over um, from, from the relational cases. So that's, that's nice. And often, um, not much more is required in practice. Um, for example, if you think about ranking, um, you know, you're mostly not interested in the probabilities, you're only interested in the ranking and you can probably achieve this in much easier ways than using probabilities. And of course, the, the second subject is if, if, if you have a, if of course you have a probability distribution, a, a proper probability distribution given, you should make use of this, right? So we're not saying don't use probabilities by no means, we're just offering sort of an alternative approach where probably probability distributions are not available um, and, and possibility distributions, um, you know, might be available. So because, you know, they're usually easier to come by um, and, and probably a bit more reliable uh, because, you know, you don't have to deal with, a, um, you know, axioms of probability all the time. And um, they're also easier to maintain. Yes. So that would be my my answer to that. So thank you very much. I don't see other questions and it's time uh, to go to the next paper, which is again uh, from you. It's about uniqueness uh, constraints on property graphs. So please, you can uh, share your other presentation. Yeah, uh, there was no answer for two. <laughs> Asymmetrization of preferential constraints with keys uh, uh, by Bernard is asking about. No, it. no question to answer for two. The better idea is then to use second order predicate load. Yes. If you want to take that as well. I think no, it was just a, a comment from him. Okay. Okay, um, fine. Okay, so we can start with the second paper. Yeah. Thank you. I think I have to get them out again. Um, Hang on, and now I can do it. So we were seeing it. Yeah, it wasn't full. Okay, so now it should it, be fine. It's it's fine. Yes. Right. Okay, so then um, sort of different data model um, about now uh, sort of not not referential integrity, but perhaps 
more entity integrity and uh, in, in, in graph databases. And sort of I've, I've um, tried to find the latest ranking of, of, of graph databases. And the point here is perhaps not you know, the ranking, but the sheer amount of different graph databases um, that are already available at these times. Of course, graph databases, you know, are actually quite old, perhaps older than uh, the relational model. Um, but of course, in, in, in recent years, in the last decade or so, um, the, the market, the commercial market has actually, um, you know, expanded rapidly to this. Of course, uh, relational database technology is, is still much more popular, but, you know, graph databases are coming. And of course, it's, it's sort of very appealing for both practitioners, theoreticians. So it's, it's, it's kind of nice to do um, work on graph databases. Um, second point is that, um, of course, uniqueness constraints um, are very important in a sense they're a bit weaker than, than, than keys um, because, you know, we don't always assume that they need to hold for, for all the tuples. Um, and they have been very popular. So in particular, you know, in, in the standard relational model for incomplete databases, uncertain databases, XML data, RDF data, ontologies, and, and also more recent for, for graph data. So there's a very recent sort of proposal by a large group of authors, um, at least I think 15 authors or so, which gave sort of a proposal for, for keys on, on, on property graphs in um, um, SIGMOD, which ran um, last week. So these are all quite, quite interesting developments as well. And what we can see in there is that, of course, um, uniqueness constraints are, are very important in, in databases, in particular for entity integrity, referential integrity, because as we've just seen, foreign keys reference um, keys and, you know, actually uh, in incomplete databases, um, uniqueness constraints. Um, and they're also important, of course, for, for database design, query processing, you know, and so on, data cleaning and so on. So what we thought of, uh, you know, we, we, we do together with uh, Philip, uh, I think who's here and, and also Kai Chi, um, we, we investigated uniqueness constraints on, on, on property graphs. Um, so, so I thought of a picture here as well, and I came up with a unicorn on, on a graph, which my daughter really liked, especially the unicorn. Um, so she was asking me what this is here on top. Um, <laughs> And she's probably still too young to explain that. But basically, it's not uniqueness on, on, on property graphs. And what we want to do is we want to introduce a, a notion um, of such uniqueness constraints that actually combine, um, that, that do not just target the consistency dimension, that, like integrity constraints usually do, but also the completeness dimension of, of, of data quality. So we want to combine both. Um, and we also want to extend the, the standard notion of uniqueness constraint from, from industry proposals such as Neo4j. And we again want to do this in a way so we can still reason about um, these uniqueness constraints efficiently. I give a few use cases and um, I characterize the implication problem then um, axiomatically and, and also algorithmically. If I have some more time, I briefly talk about combinatorics of those as well. Um, so what kind of graph model um, is being used here? So the standard one, um, well, there are many different ones, many different ones, really, but sort of one that's coming through and um, looks like it's, um, you know, has some momentum to become the standard is the so-called property graph model. And it assumes that we have a set of objects, set of labels, um, which you can think of as, as names of, of, you know, vertices, um, like relation names in the relational model. We have property attributes, which kind of refer to attributes in the relational model, and then set of values. Right? So these are just the domain values, if you want. And our property graph is, is a graph, and the vertices and the entities, uh, um, they are just objects. And then we have a function eta, which assigns essentially a, a directed um, edge from one vertex to the other. So this was an example for our vertex. This was an example in here for, for an edge and then the edge goes from one vertex to the other. And then we have a labeling function. So that means we can assign to each vertex and to each edge uh, a finite set of labels, right? So, and, and this is um, in this case here, actor and director uh, also includes the empty set, right? So you don't have to label um, edges. And then we have uh, a function, a partial function that assigns to a combination of a vertex and edge 
together with a property, um, a particular name, a particular value. Right? So in this case, we, we have this in here for this particular vertex in here. So that's kind of the, the, the property graph model. And then we can um, introduce our class of uniqueness constraints, which we call embedded uniqueness constraints as an extension of class of embedded uniqueness constraints already from relational databases. And they are expressions of this form. So there's a set L of labels, and then there are two sets E and U of properties. And um, the set U is a subset of the set E in here. And if L is a singleton, then we call this a single labeled embedded uniqueness constraint. Otherwise it's, it's multi-labeled. And the semantics is here um, given by when a graph, a property graph satisfies this embedded uniqueness constraint. And this is the case if we don't have two vertices with the following properties. So um, the graph doesn't satisfy it essentially if, if one of these fails. So, so we can't have two vertices that um, are distinct that carry both all the labels in L. And it's the case that for all the properties in E, um, all the properties are defined. And for all the properties in U, uh, they have matching values. So essentially we um, ask for uniqueness on U, on the set U, for nodes that have all values on all the properties in E um, and for nodes that have all the labels in L essentially, right? So, so we distinguish here sharply between a function of a property in E and in U, right? So if it's an E, uh, we're basically saying, okay, we're only looking at nodes that have the, all the properties in E. If it doesn't have a property in E, automatically the uniqueness constraint is not violated by this node. And then for all the nodes that have all the properties in E and all the labels in L, then we say the properties in U must be unique. All right, so we, we distinguish sharp between completeness and, and uniqueness. Um, so Neo4j uniqueness constraints are a very simple special case of these embedded uniqueness constraints, namely for single labels. And for the very special case that E and U is also equal to a singleton property u. So, so in this case, of course, uh, we only have to use um, e or u. So, so only one of them because they're always the same in here. Um, and in the case of composite indices, uh, again, we have single labels and we always have the case that e equals u. So we have an expression like this. So these are both covered as special cases of our embedded uniqueness constraints as well. So let's have a look at, at some example in here. And we have this embedded uniqueness constraint, uh, which basically says that uh, we shouldn't have two different nodes, which both have the label actor and director. Um, the property name is, is given on both and um, name should be unique, right? So in this constraint in here, uh, we looked at a real world data set, which is a standard data set in, in Neo4j um, about movies. And we have people in here, Mark Singer, who is an actor and director. He was assigned this node ID and different IDs up in here. But then we also have another actor and director node, also with the name Mark Singer in here, All right? So on both nodes, um, on both nodes, the property exists, both nodes are labeled by actor and director, and the name is the same. So this embedded uniqueness constraint is, is violated by this property graph in here. Um, and if we add just the property, for example, born in or born or post or any of these, um, just to the first set, which would mean, okay, so we, we, we look at nodes, only at those nodes, where those two properties exist, then all of a sudden this graph uh, satisfies these embedded uniqueness constraints. So it's not even the property that we want to um, distinguish the nodes by the name, but you only want to distinguish them if they have these properties born in, born in poster given. And here it's satisfied because there is no other node in here um, with uh, the property defined on born in, on born or, or poster. So that's why all of these are essentially satisfied in here. 
So that's a sort of a distinction between um, standard uniqueness constraints and these embedded uniqueness constraints where we combine completeness and, and, and uniqueness with one another. Um, so here's some more, more use cases why this could come in um, handy. So assume we want to have this embedded uniqueness constraint in here. So again, no two different nodes um, uh, where, where we have an actor and director label where the properties of born in and name are defined and where the name distinguishes the two vertices, the value and name distinguishes the two vertices. So if we have again our standard uh, property graph given in here, and now all of a sudden we want to do an update. Um, namely, we want to update the node with this particular property, with this particular value on this property, which is this node in here. And we want to update the value on born in. So we actually define it in here to be Vancouver and then return the name and born in. Then this operation uh, would basically result in a violation of the embedded uniqueness constraint because all of a sudden we would have two different nodes both uh, labeled by actor and director, both with a property born in defined, because we define it in here on this node all of a sudden, and the name would still be the same. So this would result in a violation and therefore we shouldn't be, be allowed to do this. Um, and this can be detected by this embedded uniqueness constraint. Um, if we just used a standard uniqueness constraint on, on, on you know, multi-labeled graph, which, which do not exist in, in, in Neo4j, for example, only single labeled ones and only composite indices, um, then this one here would not violate this uniqueness constraint in here. Right? So <clears throat> this would still, still be satisfied because even though we assign born in, in here, right, born in um, you know, would distinguish. Right? So, so the name would be the same, but um, born in would be, be different. Of course, this, this would not be okay in this case. Um, so we can also do physical query optimization with this. So for example, we could create a so-called filtered index um, for this embedded uniqueness constraint in here. And, and we could write something like this. So we create an index for nodes with this label um, and we index the values on, on the property name, but only for those where born in exists. And here implicitly when we write this, actually it has a, also an implicit clause exists a name that we therefore omit from the where clause in here. And then if we have this query, which basically returns nodes uh, with these labels uh, where uh, this property exists and the name property exists as well and where we return the name, if we run this query without any index, um, then it actually runs in 8.3 milliseconds on this particular um, property graph. Um, and the important point in here is that Neo4j uh, does not just look at the um, time, but it also gives you sort of the, the number of hits and the number of hits, if you add them up in here, something like 15,000, which is quite large. And it's actually, um, you know, not, not, not a good uh, query on realistically sized graphs. So it would still be inefficient in here if you have real sized graphs in here. But if you define an index, like this one before, then it actually uses, the query actually Im imposes an efficient node index scan search. And here the indices, uh, the hits are actually reduced from something like 15,000 to just 450, which indicates sort of scalability as well. And in this particular case, for this particular size database, it would go down to 2.3 milliseconds in here. Um, something else that's quite interesting, um, an interesting use case could be to design graph schemata for, for, for data quality, in particular sort of data completeness and um, consistency. So suppose we would have some kind of embedded functional dependency, which essentially says that for um, nodes labeled liable parent and where the properties of parent, child and benefit are defined, um, the parent uh, determines the, the, the benefit because um, it depends on the number of children in here, right? So if we have parent like Homer, who has a child uh, with name Lisa and another child with name Bart, based on these two children, there's a benefit of, of 240. Um, and then there's another node also with the same parent, um, but the benefit is 360 and it results actually from, from a third child, namely Maggie, but the child is not listed in here, right? So 
So that's why this FD is, is, is still satisfied because here uh, the child is, is not given in here, right? So it only has to be uh, satisfied. The FD only from parent to benefit only needs to be satisfied for those um, nodes where all the three properties exist. So if, if you have a missing child, you can't claim the benefit essentially. <clears throat> so, so this causes of course redundancy. Like if I, if I, you know, don't show you this value here to 40 on benefit, you still can infer it because um, the value is given in here and we have this FD. So we still have redundancy in here. And now what we could do is um, we could merge the first two nodes to another node uh, where we actually sort of denormalize and, and list the children together. And now logically this makes a lot more sense and it, it, it removes the redundancy. And then we've uh, basically transferred the redundancy causing functional dependency into um, an embedded uniqueness constraint of this form where the redundancy is eliminated. So it also serves the benefit again of, of you know, uh, graph schema design, um, perhaps with, with set value properties in this case. So this I think would be very worth uh, exploring as well. So let's go to um, sort of the reasoning properties. And again, looking at the implication problem, um, so again, here we are asking basically given a set of these embedded uniqueness constraint, when does sigma imply phi? Again, and um, applications of this are to minimize the delay in update time because we don't need to look at implied dependencies, but also maximizes opportunities for, for query optimization if we can decide implication efficiently. And as we've just seen, we can opt automate perhaps uh, schema design if we can solve the implication problem effectively. And the axiomatic axiomatic characterization uh, only requires one rule, this one in here, uh, which basically just says, well, we can uh, simply extend the labels or we can extend um, the set E of properties or we can extend um, the set U of uniqueness constraints. Of course, again, with, uh, with a restriction that uh, the union of these sets must be a subset of the union of this set in here. And then <clears throat> we can show that this inference rule is actually sound and complete for the implication of EUCs. Um, so if we applied, um, you know, this this embedded uniqueness constraint in here, uh, we can apply this rule in different ways. So we could extend either the labels or we could extend the set E of, of properties that the nodes should have, or we could extend, um, you know, this one here with, with born, if, if born is already given in here and it is, and that's fine. So this would be sort of a, a, a derivation sequence of applying this inference axiom here. And this is already sound and complete, so, so very simple. And the algorithm to decide implication is, is, is even simpler. We just have to look for a rule which basically um, subsumes um, you know, another embedded uniqueness constraint according to the rule that we've just seen. So it's very simple to, to decide. Um, in fact, it's, it's linear, it's um, basically you only have to scan the input once. So um, we can directly see that, that, that this um, particular embedded uniqueness constraint implies this one in here because this is just an application of this inference rule in here. And um, the opposite direction does not hold essentially because we cannot find a rule um, for, for, for this one, we cannot find a rule where the labels um, and the extensions and the uniqueness constraints are actually a subset of those that are given in here because born is included in here. And if, if of course this is not implied, then there should be a counter example for its implication. And that was just the property graph from before in here where the first rule is, is satisfied by this graph because this node again does not have this property born. Um, but this one, the second one is, is, set as, is, is of course violated in here because um, both nodes labeled actor and director, they have the property name and the name has the same value in here. So this one, the second one here is, is violated whereas the first one is satisfied. So it's not implied, right. Um, perhaps um, I'll go, I'll skip sort of this. This is not in the paper anyway. So this was just, an extension and I summarize here. So 
These embedded uniqueness constraints that we've introduced, they essentially subsume uniqueness constraints from, from industry, in particular from the most popular database system, Neo4j. Um, they capture both completeness and integrity requirements. So completeness by um, the set E, um, multiple labels by the set L, and then um, the integrity requirements as, as, as in the standard itself. And then we also take advantage of multiple labels, which is not a property um, of um, you know, the property graph model in, in general. Um, there are powerful use cases in here. So in particular, efficient updates and queries, but also potentially graph schema design, um, not just for data integrity, but data quality perhaps in, in general. And uh, we have efficient reasoning capabilities in here. So in the form of a very simple axiomatization and a very simple linear time algorithm. And future work kind of uh, includes sort of the sampling, um, uh, in, in, in terms of finding, uh, you know, nice, nice, uh, uh, let's say sample databases in here, or given a database, actually the discovery problem of, of these keys and embedded uniqueness constraints. Or one can also think of other notions of uniqueness constraints um, and, and even other constraints, of course. Um, so perhaps um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I ask uh, if there is uh, any question, you can uh, raise hands, uh, you can write in the chat or in the question of answer. So, um, there is uh, a question in the chat from Bernard, if you want to take this one first. It's about uh, the definition of constraint restricted to all attributes and the label that occur or that are potentially considered. Um, so, so what um, my question is, what, what, what is meant by complete nonsense except one case attribute? What, what do you mean by case attribute? I ah, think you, okay, so, so where you have only one property in, in, in there. Well, yeah, but I, I mean, we, we, we kind of, so, so the point is, is not necessarily that we want to use them actually for, for, for management, uh, but we want to use them for management under dirty data, right? So, and, and often what we found, and, and I invite you to have a look at the paper, um, you can find a lot of dirty data based on the satisfaction of these embedded uniqueness constraints, where you would expect um, the actual uniqueness constraint to hold, right? So, and, and you can often see that uh, um, there are a lot of, factual errors that you can find um, based on the uniqueness constraint being violated, but the embedded uniqueness constraint being satisfied. So in a sense, it, 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 it's nice um, because you can still manage integrity to some degree or another um, under dirty data. Thank you. Are there other questions? Just check. Okay, uh, I have one because you have mentioned one thing that uh, is about the, the cleaning of data. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you say that uh, you expect uh, basically that the domain expert will uh, look at the data and decide, okay? And you, you are giving an example in your representation about uh, the redundancy elimination and the example of the social benefit, okay? So that, uh, you put the two children together and uh, you eliminate the redundancy. But the question there is, uh, uh, depends on the semantics of those data, because uh, it could be that you are giving, uh, you have a single benefits, uh, one for one child and for one another. So you have uh, 480 as a total. And, uh, or you could have uh, that uh, this person is getting benefits uh, for a total of 240, including both children. So, uh, the expert will not know uh, which one is correct. So when you say you eliminated redundancy, uh, this is very much dependent on the semantics you're giving to that data. Do they get it right? Yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely, right? So, so I mean, if you, if, you, if you don't know what the constraint means, of course, um, you, you know, you're, you're, you're always in danger, right? So, and, and you would think that, you know, you, you, if, if it's not meaningful, you can't find dirty data. Right? Okay. So, so, so at least you don't have evidence for dirty data. So, so the, the game, I mean, 
if you really want to clean data and talk about dirty data, you will always need some kind of domain expert, right? So the game is more, um, you know, can you, can you have rules that make it simple to at least highlight the cases which might be dirty data? Mm -hmm. Right, so so I'm so, I'm not claiming I'm not claiming a universal formula in here, right? So 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 I'm just saying that these are quite um, you know robust constraints which we found um, you know when we mined these constraints from from this particular uh, movie database, we were quite surprised by how many different by how many factual errors we found based on inspecting the constraints that were violated. So, so we found these embedded uniqueness constraints and when we thought, oh, well, why, why doesn't this key actually hold? And then we looked and we saw, we saw oh, because, you know, this, this, this constraint here, it, it, it's only violated because there's a factual error in there. So we, we, we did this by fact checking and there were sort of birthdays were wrong or they were just inserted with, with some, you know, silly values um, and we could find these. And because it's, it's quite a convincing case because this is used as a standard data set um, by Neo4j. It's in the sandbox, right? So, so it was quite, I was trying to write this up into the paper to make a really good, good case. And uh, if you read through this, you can really see quite some surprising facts in this publicly available data set. So this is a, this will be a combination of, uh, well, the ability of identifying potential <laughs> violations, but then you need an, an in-depth understanding both of the data and of the constraints yeah. uh, to and be really yeah. able to, to decide. Yeah. So, I mean, there's also a strong, and in fact, I, I would argue that, that you need both anyway. I mean, if, if, if you can only identify dirty data if they violate some business rule. Right, so, so, so you need to have a good understanding about the rules, about the business rules. Without that, yeah. you can't have any evidence of dirty data, right? So, yeah. so it goes hand in hand. And in a sense, this, this approach kind of goes into that direction, but not for, of course, not for all data quality problems, only those related to perhaps duplication, uniqueness, and, and, and these kind mm -hmm. of matters. But also there, the, you could have some ambiguity of interpretation of the data when entering the data. So when I write it 140, the one entering the data could have a different understanding of what the meaning is, whether it's the total or just a partial uh, contribution for the single child. Yeah, I, I uh, mean, that of course needs to be doc this documented. This is a, a very tricky, yeah, very tricky example <laughs> that you're presenting yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, okay. So thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, I I don't see, let me check the chat. I don't see any questions anymore. So thank you very much. Uh, and I think we can give the floor to Stefan Arman. I see him there. So you can uh, start uh, sharing your screen uh, and uh, I will introduce you now. Okay. So. Sebastian is a, no, sorry, I, um, Stefan, uh, is, uh, is a PhD student, uh, a research assistant at the Business Process Technology Group at ASSO Platner Institute in Potsdam, done in Germany. And um, he is working on modern analyzing knowledge intensive processes and focus in particular on principal relationship of data and processes. Uh, he's presenting uh, some work done in collaboration with Marco Montali from the Free University of uh, Boden and uh, his supervisor, uh, Matthias uh, Veske. So I see your screen, Stefan, so uh, you, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for the introduction. As already mentioned, today I'm presenting um, yeah, joint work with Marco Montali and Matthias Veske. Um, with the title, Refining Case Models with Cardinality Constraints. So I don't have any unicorns for you and I don't have Simpsons for you, but for, the, for at least two more seconds, you can enjoy this view of the night skyline of Melbourne. Okay, so I'm talking about processes and data today. And from process modeling, we know that we can model the 
activities, the control flow between the activities, decision and events that occur. Furthermore, we can model data objects and data operations. So if you look at this simple example, it's some small um, travel booking process where we receive a travel request from an employee. We check the information and then we will either reject them or continue with the process. And then we can book the accommodation, the transportation, assemble both to create some travel documents and send the travel documents back to the employee. During this process, different data objects are created and accessed, where, for example, the travel request, the accommodation reservation, transportation plan, and the travel documents. So basically, our activities in the process are the data operations. They are responsible for the crude operations. So we can have a data flow from a data object node to an activity node. This represents that the data object node or that the data object is read. And we can also have an, an arc from the activity node to the data object node, which means that it is written. If a data object is read and written, it's, it is updated. If it is only written without being read before, it's created. So this is kind of the process modeling point of view. Of course, there is the data point of view. When we model the data structure, for example, the classes and the attributes, as well as the associations among those classes. Again, consider this example. We have the travel request. Of course, we need a destination, a departure date, a return date, and in the business setting, also a cost center responsible for paying for the travel. And then there are also the accommodation reservation with a name and a reservation number and the transportation plan. We see that we have associations. So for travel requests can be associated to accommodation reservations and also to transportation plans, which both in turn can be associated to travel documents. What we can do now, we can link these classes to our process model or to the data objects in our process model to give more details about the data that is used during the process. So now we see exactly how the travel request is structured and what the different attributes are and how it is associated to other objects. Now, usually when we create, for example, UML class diagrams or ER diagrams, we may also extend these associations with cardinality constraints. So in this example, we may, for example, say that every travel request has up to one accommodation reservation and up to one transportation plan. And each of these has up to one travel document associated. On the other hand, the travel documents are always associated to an accommodation reservation and always associated to a transportation plan. Here you see, if you take a close look, that we only have two types of cardinality constraints. We have the exactly one, and we have the up to one cardinality constraints. And this is a common assumption um, done in process modeling, that if we view one single process instance, that all data is local to this process instance, and that there is at most one data object for each data object node, so to say, one instance of each class. However, observations in both process mining, for example, and process modeling show that these assumptions do not always hold. Quite contrary, data is very essential to the process execution and the associations between, um, between the data objects are quite important to explain the behavior that we observe. I would like to look at one particular category of processes in which this plays a fundamental role, the so-called knowledge intensive processes. While traditional processes are usually quite very structured and limited to a small set of variants, Knowledge intensive processes are considered to be multivariant. They change quite fast, so need to be adapted con um, yeah, continuously. They are inherently data driven and centered around a human. This means that there is an expert, a so called knowledge worker, that is responsible for deciding the, on the right course of action, so what activities to execute next. If you look at it on the spectrum, as it was um, presented by Di Ciccio and his co authors, and we see we have the very structured processes. And when the processes become more knowledge intensive, they become less structured and at the same time offer less opportunity for automation. I'm today in particular looking at these processes that are somewhere in the middle. So they're mostly unstructured, but have some predefined segments that may be loosely coupled. 
And we see already here our traditional business process modeling languages, such as BPMN, are not, um, do not fit this particular use case. So there are other approaches. One of them is a fragment-based case management approach, which was presented by Heveld and Beskin. The general idea is to take ideas from both activity-centric process modeling and data-centric process modeling. We take then the process and split it into multiple fragments that can be combined dynamically at runtime. So a fragment can run concurrently, it can run repeatedly, but all of them operate on a shared set of data attributes, uh, data objects. So through the data flow, we can then represent re um, dependencies between, between different fragments that lead to synchronization in the execution. Once again, I have a very simple example. Probably most of you are somehow familiar with it. We submit a paper, and it, um, or the paper is submitted, and eventually there's a decision for the paper, so it's accepted or rejected. But in order to perform a decision, we need multiple reviews. This is not covered by this first fragment, but by a second fragment that assigns a review and then creates a review subsequently. To successfully execute the model process, we need to execute the assign review and create review activity multiple times between submit paper and decide on paper. This can be done concurrently. So for example, we can first assign three reviews and then create three reviews. It could also be done sequentially. Um, this is not specified here. And once again, we can also have a data model. Fragment-based case management actually assumes that there is a data model that describes the data objects in our process. So we have classes, we have associations between these classes and cardinality constraints limiting the associations. There's one particular class, the stereotype case class, and this is a central class to the case model. It is instantiated exactly once for each process instance and more or less the whole process evolves around this, pro uh, around this central object. And now then we have the cardinality constraints as mentioned. If you look at them, they say, for example, that for the conference, we may have arbitrary many papers that are submitted by author teams and an author team may submit one, uh, up to 10 papers. And for each paper, we have up to four reviews and up to one decision, which again is based on three to four reviews. So these are constraints that must never be violated during the process execution. They must always hold. And therefore they are quite strict on the process, but they are quite relaxed on the data. We therefore um, introduce another set of cardinality constraints, which we call goal cardinality constraints. We uh, precede them with this diamond symbol um, inspired by linear temporal logic. And we say, okay, while a conference can have arbitrary many papers, eventually it should have at least 50. And while a paper may have up to four reviews, it should have eventually three to four, and also one decision. This idea is not completely new. So um, Will van der Arts and his co-authors in the object-centric object behavior constraints introduced those eventually cardinalities on a global view. So not on a case-by-case -case view, but on a global view. And we are now interested in the impact of these domain models with associations and um, cardinality constraints on the process execution. So therefore, let's look at an example. First, we need to investigate how activities create and link data objects, because these are important to understand how the constraints come into play. Here again, we submit a paper and we send a submission notification. The author team is an optional input. It may also be created during a submit paper. Now let's assume we have a conference object, for example, the KAIS 2021 object. This activity, submit paper, reads the object when executed, creates then both an author team and um, the paper. I took this paper. And then it also checks the domain model for the associations and sees, okay, these objects can be associated, let's link them. 
So that after executing the activity, we do not only have the data objects, so we are also aware about the links that exist between these objects. Since links and associations are constrained by our cardinality constraints, we see also an impact on our process execution. Once again, here we have an example. We have the conference that is scheduled, and now we look at all papers that are submitted for a certain conference. The conference is open for submission, eventually closed for submission, and then the review is eventually closed. We also have a fragment for submitting paper. This is the one we have seen before. From our domain model, we know that we require at least 50 papers eventually. So we know that between open submission and closed submission, which is the only um, point at which papers can be submitted, 50 papers need to be submitted. And thus, this fragment needs to be executed 50 times, at least 50 times. So our lower bounds can translate to lower bounds for activities and fragments. The same goes for upper bounds. For example, each paper may have up to four reviews. And this means we cannot assign more than four reviews to a single paper. And the activity assigned review is therefore not executed more than four times. Lastly, I would like to look at the input and output behavior of activities. As in BPMN, activities can have alternative input sets and output sets. Only when executed once, the activity reads only one of the input sets and writes only one of the output sets. Here we have the decision activity, and we have three different outcomes. Output set O is one, considers all the reviews to accept the paper. Output set two is very similar. It considers all the reviews to reject the paper. And then there's output set three. And it basically says, okay, we consider the, we looked at all the reviews, but we're inconclusive. We cannot come to a decision yet. We will require another review. From the domain model, we know that a decision requires at least three reviews. So if we have less than three reviews, we can only produce output set three. If there are three reviews, all of the three output sets are available. So we can require additional review, for example, a meter review, or we can um, reject or accept the paper right away. And if there are already four reviews, we cannot create and require a new one because that would violate it violate our cardinality constraints, so we can only accept or reject our paper. We aimed at describing this um, precisely, and therefore we present execution semantics by mapping fragment-based case management models to colored petri nets. The general structure probably looks familiar. We have places that represent data objects in certain, um, certain states. So one token on this place conference open for submission is one conference in state open for submission. The um, token has a value. It consists of the class of this data object and an identifier. The activity is represented by a transition that they can then consume a token and produce a token into a different place or the same place to represent an update. For example, a conference is consumed and bound to the variable conf and then the same conference is updated and written to the conference closed for submission. But you might remember, in the same step, we also update all the conference's papers from state submitted to state in review. This requires us to not only consume a single um, token from this place, but multiple ones. And not just any tokens, but those that are associated to the conference. We therefore add an additional place for the associations. It has a single token that contains a set of associations and where an association is an unordered pair of objects. We can query these objects. So for example, find all the papers that are associated to our conference. And these are then the represent then the tokens that are consumed and produced. Furthermore, we also need to check those cardinality constraints. You might remember we require at least 50 papers to close the submission. So we take the very same set, all the papers that are associated to the conference, and check that there are at least 50. Thereby, we embed the um, constraints of the domain model into our process semantics. The semantics do not allow for any violation. 
Okay, we support this with two prototypes. So we, on the one hand, um, implemented a compiler that automatically translates fragment-based case mod models to color petri nets, which are compatible with CPN tools, and a small engine that again uses CPN tools to kind of allow you to step through the process, fill in data, and see how different activities get enabled and disabled depending on the associations and objects that exist. They are all available on GitHub, so if you're interested, feel free to check it out. To summarize, we see that processes instantiate and maintain data. They are responsible for creating objects for the classes and links for the associations. Of, on the other side, associations in the data model are usually constraints constrained with cardinality constraints. We use the global cardinality constraints that must never be, be violated and the goal cardinality constraints that must be reached during, during the process at the end. These then have an impact on our process execution. We see that lower and upper bounds on the cardinalities translate to lower and upper bounds for our activities. So they may be, in this case, at least executed at least m times at, at most n times. We also see that these cardinality constraints force us to operate on sets of data objects, so some kind of batch processing. And finally, cardinality constraints can limit our input and output combinations. Um, these are important steps to look at the verification of those flexible data-driven processes, but it does not only apply to some case management like um, fragment-based case management, but also to BPMN when we have multiple instance um, sub-processes or loops, um, cardinality constraints may be bounds for these. This concludes my talk um, and I'm happy to answer any questions and welcome any feedback and comments. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Stefan. Uh, first of all, I invite uh, the attendees, uh, if uh, there are any questions, uh, to, to ask them uh, in the chat or raise your hand. Yes, uh, there is a raised hand. So now, uh, please, you can ask your question. You can uh, unmute yourself. Um, hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. So it's nice to see this, uh, this work evolving. Very nice. So my question is... Who are you? Giancarlo, right? Yeah. Giancarlo. I don't... I don't... Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Hello. Yeah, I see your name in a little corner, sorry. Okay, so Giancarlo Guizar. I, okay, I thought on. everyone could see that. Um, so the question is, so more than cardinality constraints, typically you have um, some other types of modal constraints in these relations, right? Like existential dependence between classes, between objects and model uh, in the class level. You see that in you know weak entities in ER, UML kind of simulates this with, with mandatory constraints plus immutability. And I think that would have an, uh, an impact on the ordering of activities, right? If you have a chain of existential dependence. So I was wondering if you guys thought about that or have that uh, you know, plan for the future. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, nice catch. Yeah, that's actually quite important. Um, we consider existential um, relationships. Not only that, we also we require them. We do not support other associations. This is due to the fact that we not need to know precisely when two objects get linked. And if it's not existential, we would need to enrich our process model with this information. By having the existential knowledge, we, we can say, okay, we have an order in which objects need to be created. And this order also dictates when two objects are linked, namely always when new objects get created. So yeah, we consider that. Oh, and okay. uh, I, th I think that's a very good point. And there are some modeling approaches that would uh, you know, match perfectly with this technique because they would produce necessarily relations which are of existential dependence. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, congratulations again. I'll talk to Marco about this later. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks. So th thank you very much. Uh, I saw another hand raised before, Bernarda Lime. I don't know if you are still there, if you want to take your microphone. Can I do it? Yes, I, I can hear you. Um, you run uh, with BPMN and all these um, 
um, a little bit um, less, uh, let's say, correct um, process uh, languages into the classical transaction problem. For instance, you have in your case uh, two parallel actions that are somehow in the interdependent. And in this case, you have to use a strict separation of types of, for the data model. What you did, for instance, with accommodation and with the transport. It should be completely separated. But the, the final document type depends again that this can be combined. Mm -hmm. It means in this case, you have to have some kind of, let's say, uh, super, let's say, a separation approach in order to handle such things. And then you have also the problem of exceptions. Um, so you have the full bunch of uh, all problems we have had in database uh, technology already a long time ago. Would it be better to have something like dynamic constraints, constraints that can change during process execution? Um, yes. Something that has been developed okay. in the 90s, long, long time ago to handle it in databases when the process models were not available, but maybe this would be a possibility to handle it. Mm -hmm. um, interesting idea. I have to think about it a little bit. So on the one hand, we have some, some dynamic already with this two, type of, um, two types of cardinality constraints where one refines the other. But um, of course, I agree that this could be way more refined. Um, one idea would to be to look at um, ontologies and, for example, the phase pattern where we can model um, yeah, the constraints independence of the data object state. And then we could also have a dynamic still combined with, process with the process model. And that would definitely be something interesting to look at, but we did not so far. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Are there other questions? I'm checking. There is uh, another raise hand by Marco Montali. Please, Marco, who is uh, also an author of this uh, paper. Hi, Barbara. Hey, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Hello. I just wanted to, to make uh, an, an additional, uh, like, meta level comments on, on both the questions by, by Bernard. So I, I think what, what is particularly interesting when it comes to combining uh, this data modeling approach uh, and then the process modeling approach uh, is exactly that this type of patterns uh, that have been studied before can be seen with a new life, basically, right? So, so for example, Stefan was showing today the presence of these uh, two types of cardinality constraints, those that, that always need to hold and those that eventually need to hold. And, and this is basically an approximation of uh, many of the patterns that, uh, that you could see in conceptual modeling. Stefan was mentioning now the phase pattern, right? So, so you could refine these eventual cardinalities to introduce uh, subclasses where an object would migrate when you are in the right state of the process, and then you would apply the cardinality there. So what is interesting is now to, to look precisely at these patterns in the context where you have a dynamics that is working on those. And that's where this could be seen as just as a starting point for, for now reassessing these uh, previous studies done in conceptual modeling in the context of uh, these processes operating over data. Thank you. Thank you for the, the comment. Um, I see the other uh, hands raised, Sebastian first. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, nice, nice presentation and, and, and paper. Um, just a comment in, in, in general, I mean, of course, with, with um, the eventual cardinality constraints, um, you can go much broader with that and, and say, okay, so we could have eventual consistency. And this is, of course, not something new that has been introduced um, quite some time ago, and, and, and you can have eventual consistency with that. Right, so, so my, but my other question was, um, when you looked at the cardinality constraints, um, after you've done that, did you actually figure out, oh, maybe I should optimize my process. Maybe it's, uh, it's, it's, it's better to do it differently. So does that, my, my question is, can you somehow redesign the process or, or optimize it in some way or another? Um, 
I would say it definitely opens up new design um, possibilities because those cardinality constraints are directly considered in the um, in the process. And before, sometimes you would need to um, need to introduce those um, those constraints on some in some way on the process level. For example, by introducing additional states that are used in the process or written in the process, or by um, by yeah adding more knowledge during implementation or by adding control flow constructs that um, enforce the order and now this is done or can be done through the um, cardinality constraints so we can model the process less strictly and rely more on the constraints that already exist in our data models to derive an order of the activities Well, thank you. I think uh, Giancarlo wanted to add uh, uh, some comments or, co or questions. Yes, yeah, thank you, Barbara. Very quickly. Uh, uh, so, Marco, uh, well, it's a suggestion, actually. So, when listening to Marco about this distinction between things that should always hold and things that should eventually hold, I can think of a third category. It reminds me of uh, this paper by Terry Hopping on the on the athletic versus uh, deontic modality and how they would reflect on Cardinal constraints. So imagine that you have Cardinal constraints that should hold, but you wanna, uh, you know, treat the case in which they don't. Like for example, people should, do, should not be married to more than one person at the same time, but you wanna do something about the case in which that Cardinal constraint violated, right? And this could be related to exception handling, for example, in process models. So just a suggestion that, you know, it might be useful to capture these cases as well. Definitely an interesting point. Thanks. So, thank you. I don't see any other questions. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, I just had a, a final one, uh, because you were positioning yourself uh, a reference to the, the research paper about the classification. Uh, quite uh, low, so you are quite flexible as an approach, but then uh, uh, you're working on fragments, uh, so this is making it possible to combine things and so on, but you are quite rigid on the constraints in the end. So if they are violated, you are not going to allow a fifth review in your, uh, in your uh, conference. Uh, uh, process. Uh, by the way, I was glad to see this example. We are living with that one uh, with so much, uh, it has so many <laughs> issues and we are all familiar with the process and it's a difficult process. So uh, there, the problem is that, uh, uh, so you position uh, yourself in a um, quite flexible, we are going uh, towards a uh, quite flexible uh, uh, situation, but uh, in the end, uh, you are also very rigid. So how, how would you comment on that? Yeah. So uh, the idea of the fragment-based case management model is uh, management approach is that a model is rather rigid. However, it, um, it supports to be adapted at runtime. So if this exception occurs that um, a fourth review is just empty and we need another fifth one, um, then, it, um, then we might deviate from the model and extend the model to allow it for this single instance and maybe for future instance that needs to be decided. Um, that being said, this is a central idea of um, fragment-based case management, but we did not um, not look at it into detail in this paper on how this would yeah what would be the implications on the process execution what what would be allowed what is not allowed so yeah. definitely also future work okay thank you i see i, I think uh, there are still raisins i see again uh, uh, bernard and, and marco so bernard I was first i think and then we will close the section after those i see also something in the chat only a little advice. Um, in the 90s, they have been uh, considered approximate or normal cardinality constraints. Uh, uh, they could handle the and they are not uh, uh, considering the exceptional case, they are only considering the normal case. There was a lot of uh, research on that in the 90s, long, long time ago. Sorry for that. 
it was before you started to do this, this work. <laughs> uh, definitely. Um, I, I'm not aware of it or not fully aware. I will look at it. Thank you. Marco, you have okay, something to add? I that. I wanted just to say, uh, uh, yeah, apart, apart to reinforce what Bernard was saying, uh, so that there are many words that become relevant again uh, in the light of this process plus data combination. We are trying to, like, to crawl all, all of them. <laughs> it's very difficult <laughs> also because of terminological differences, right? And, uh, and focus differences. So now that you have an explicit representation of a process, uh, some of these uh, aspects can be imported. Some require genuine investigation, I would say. So it's always a little bit tricky. What I wanted to say related to, to you know, how this affects the process execution it co uh, connects to, to your previous point, uh, Bernard, which is, uh, it, it was never clear to me, I have to say, even if, when you don't have the data part modeled in a process, whether once you have concurrency, for example, you really imply true concurrency or interleaving. This is typically left unspecified, right? And, and then whether this becomes true concurrency or interleaving, depends on a lot of different factors, right? For example, whether that part of the process insists on the same resource, right? If it is always the same person that will need to handle these two branches, then this will become, uh, this will become uh, interleaving, right? So, so the hope now is that by making this relationship explicit, one would, would be able to understand when, uh, when you model something uh, concurrently in the process that's true concurrency or instead is interleaving. So I, I think this, this could help in, uh, in disambiguating these kind of aspects. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Marco. So that is uh, back, going back to co-design of uh, functionality and structuring, or structuring and functionality in my case. Um, that's a long discussion. I propose uh, somehow uh, res resume the session. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, please, please, in, please include also Sebastian. He knows quite a lot about it. We do. Okay, so I, I leave uh, this uh, to offline discussion now, and I think I thank uh, the speakers and also the lively audience uh, with uh, all the comments. Uh, so thank you to everybody and have a nice lunch or night, depending on where you are. And uh, see you again uh, in another occasion. Okay, bye. Yes.